morning. Oh, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? All right. Well, this first song, you know, we, we in our Sunday school lesson, it talked about loving the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, and the way we can do that is praising the Lord. And aren't we lucky to be in church to be able to just let ourselves praise? So our first song, if you always stand, it actually says, lift your hands to heaven. Now, you know, we, uh, we have a hard time doing that sometimes. I get really excited over there on the pew and I start here. And sometimes it doesn't get up because we're, you know, high enough. This song says, praise God, lift your hands to heaven and praise the Lord. So whoever's got it, take it away. first one is smile yeah the second one is close your eyes so you're not sitting there thinking wonder if they wonder if they raised their hands over there so close your eyes so you don't see anybody else and let's just praise the lord okay let's just pray Can be seated and let me just say welcome this morning if you are uh, visiting with us today we are certainly honored by your presence and uh, welcome you to First Baptist Church and uh, it's good to see the church family as I look out and I see some of the church family and uh, I just want you to know how much I love you and it's good to see you in the place of worship and um, we're here to just celebrate the Lord we I want to pray for Chuck as he has been diagnosed with the flu on Thursday. And then uh, as we traveled to Arkansas, I began losing my voice while there, and it still hasn't quite caught up with me. I'm still waiting on it to get back, uh, but we'll get through the day. But anyway, we certainly want to welcome you uh, this morning to our morning service. Do y'all hear those bells? It reminds me of wedding bells. And I have the privilege this morning to announce some good news. I want to announce that Cameron Kelly has finally come to good senses. <laughs> and he has proposed to a young lady that is a member of our church, Miss Caitlin Parker. <laughs> Caitlin, <clears throat> why, don't you, uh, why don't you stand a minute? And could you show that hardware off a little bit? Now, don't let that blind you, folks. We've got some pretty good hardware going here. Well, congratulations to you, Caitlin and Cameron. Uh, they are going to be wedded on April the 22nd, and so we're excited for them, and uh, you be in prayer for them. Uh, Cameron is, uh, I th is just been promoted to staff sergeant, and so pray as he is still serving uh, our nation. Uh, he will be deployed to Korea uh, this summer, so please keep him in prayer and uh, lift it up. But we did want to announce it, and it's an honor to be able to announce that uh, to the church on their behalf, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about this in days to come. So uh, we, we rejoice with them, and be, we need to be praying for them. All right, as far as other prayer matters, I know this is our time to pause and pray for special needs. So let me share a couple of with, with you this morning. Uh, as you 
know, many of you know, uh, Billy Duncan uh, has had a, a long battle here for many months now, and uh, the Lord in his mercy has called Billy home, and uh, so we need to pray, especially for his family today. Uh, just keep Regina and uh, all of her family uh, lifted up uh, to the Lord during this time of grief and sorrow. Uh, the visitation for Billy will be Monday from 4 to 8 at the uh, uh, Main Street location of McDonald and New. And then the funeral service will be Tuesday at 11. And uh, church family, we're, we're going to provide a meal that day on Tuesday in the fellowship hall. So if you can uh, provide a, a dish, uh, a meal, a meat dish or vegetable dish or dessert, uh, the fellowship hall will be unlocked that morning. You can come by and drop that off and, and the hospitality team will uh, be in charge of, of the meal. So. Uh, just be aware of that opportunity we have to be a blessing to their family and uh, keep them in prayer. Also pray for Nathan Connors. Uh, Nathan is having surgery tomorrow, and if you went on our Alaska mission trip, you're aware that he was having some pretty severe um, struggles even on the trip back in June, and he is finally uh, able to have surgery. And so let's pray for him uh, today and tomorrow. And then I want to brag on you. Uh, commend you. 300 meals were delivered on Thanksgiving Day, and that is awesome. Uh, and that's uh, a lot of food and a lot of uh, deliveries, and I heard we, we may have ran out of mashed potatoes toward the end, but we were able to get uh, the meals out and uh, across the county. And so thank you for those of you that prepared uh, food or if you came and helped organize or delivered meals. Uh, this is all about you, church, and I uh, just commend you for the good work. This morning in our early service, we had a young couple with a child uh, that came to worship with us. And as I went back to talk to them, they said, well, your church brought us a meal yesterday. We live on the county line. We live a long ways out, and we've been struggling about and talking about needing to go to church and get in church. And he said, your act of kindness caused us to realize we need to go visit your church. And so there you go, folks. That's, that's what it's about, just being kind and considerate and caring uh, to others and let the Lord minister to them as needed. So thank you uh, for the good job, uh, job well done. Well, we're going to have a word of prayer now, and uh, let's pray for these. And if you have a prayer burden yourself, why don't you take that to the Lord right now with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Whatever it is that's on your heart, I know we just have came out of Thanksgiving, so we have much to be thankful for, but it's amazing how we can go from a high to a low. And so this morning, if you're here and you just feel a little despair or your spirit is a little depressed. Just ask the Heavenly Father to encourage and renew and revive your joy. And look unto Him. Um, whatever experience you've had this week, good, bad, ugly, in between, just know that God is faithful and He's a constant. And Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And so find your hope in Him. Find your joy in Him today. Now, Father, I want to pray for the congregation gathered I pray your Holy Spirit would minister to every need that's present here this morning. I pray especially for the spiritual needs that exist within this building. I pray that if there's anyone here that hasn't yielded their life to Christ, that today they would consider the claims of Christ. And I pray for every child of God that would strive to mature and grow in their faith and in their love for Christ. Lord, we do pray for Nathan as he has surgery tomorrow. Father, we pray for the many folks that received meals this week, and we pray for the young couple that was here this morning, that you'll just continue to work in their life and draw them to a, a good church home. Father, how we celebrate with Caitlin and Cameron and pray that the months ahead of them preparing for their wedding day will be blessed, and you'll especially bless their marriage. And then, Father, we pray for the Duncan family. We know, Lord, that... They're grateful to you that their dad, their granddad, their uncle, their family members no longer suffering. 
but I know their hearts still grieve. And Father, I thank you that you're the God who made family and you gave us such a unique uh, relationship within family that we love one another. And when a loved one passes on to be with you, Lord, it is a, a time of a challenge and sorrow. And I pray you would comfort them. And may they just walk in the presence of the Holy Spirit during these next few days, Lord. Father, we ask your blessings as we try to preach the word today. Lord, take this passage that we find ourselves in that's before us. And Holy Spirit, help us to handle it properly. And Lord, I pray that you'd just uh, speak to the hearts of every soul present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. is a wonderful gift from God and we are just so uh, uh, happy to sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus so I was brought up that I didn't really hear grace a lot and I don't know I don't blame it on the church I was probably talking and missed it all so when I came uh, here brother Tackett's wife Sue um, I went to her and I said I just don't I'm not sure I'm gonna go to heaven how do I get to heaven what do I need to do and I knew it wasn't good enough. And uh, so I, I thought, what in the world? And Sue Tackett explained to me about grace and how it was a gift from God. And I could not do anything but love the Lord to, to win that grace. So stand as we sing the next two songs that are about grace. Sing the first part. You got it? Okay. Go ahead. Men only.
lucky we've got Kylie back on the piano. I don't think we realize how fortunate this church is with all the musicians that we have. And there are plenty of you all sitting out there that have never shown your face or fingers or anything. So, but and Dave's been doing this for what, 102 years now. And uh, so uh, we are so thankful. And thank you, Kylie. It sounds good you being back with us. Okay, we're gonna sing something else about grace, how it is greater than our sin.
Thank you, Dave and Melody, for being there for us this morning in the early service and also in the late service. And thank you, Kylie, for also stepping up and helping us this morning, and we appreciate you all so much. If you have your Bibles and would like to join me in the reading of our text, it's found in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. We'll be reading to verse 30. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit." Now, the text of Scripture this morning is one of those, uh, you wouldn't call this a little easy sermonette. Uh, This is one of those hard-hitting passages, and uh, one of the benefits of preaching through books of the Bible, the way I try to do it, is that it it guards me from uh, what I'll call uh, taking a bypass when we come to sections of this nature, I told Libby, I said, of all times, uh, our study of Mark lands us in the text dealing with the unpardonable sin. Tonight's text uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians has to do with the role of women. And so I thought, boy, you talk about a day uh, to deal with some tough issues. And if you want to read the section of 1 Corinthians, go ahead and read it before you get here tonight. Uh, It's a very complicated text. And... uh, I've already had one of the elderly men said, you better be careful tonight. (laughs) And I said, I'm just going to preach what the Bible says. And he said, well, I guess it's good you've got that to fall back on. I thought, that's all I've got to fall back on is the Bible, uh, the Word of God. Here we come to this scene in which Christ, as we know, uh, he's already being attacked by the religious leaders of that day. they're struggling. They, they are really struggling with his rise in the eyes of the people. Uh, his words and his works, I mean, the crowds are growing. The people are becoming just a frenzy of excitement around Jesus. And here are the religious leaders who had studied the law of God all of their life. They'd been to the right Bible colleges. They went to the right seminary. They knew what the Old Testament said about the Messiah. They knew what he was going to do when he came. They knew what he would say when he came. And you would have thought, man, uh, they would have spotted that Jesus was the Messiah quickly. But their sin had blinded their eyes. Uh, They were people who loved their religion but they really didn't have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Uh, They may have known the old covenant law by memory and in their mind, but it had not really changed their heart. And that's one of the dangers in Christianity today is as generations go, if we do not instill a love for Jesus in our children and uh, instill a love for His Word in their heart, Within about the third generation, it's like you're starting the process all over, evangelizing as though they uh, had never heard. And so, parents, uh, if you're a first-generation Christian, uh, you're going to have to work hard. 
uh, to instill in your children a, a deep love for Christ. Uh, because if you don't, their level of love will be a bit less than yours. And by the time they have children, their level of commitment and love and faith will be uh, even less than their parents. And it just continues to diminish and diminish. So these folks, they did not have a life-altering relationship uh, with, with God. And so now Jesus is very prominent. He is healing people. He is casting out demons. Now, it's not that they had never seen anything like that happen. Uh, exorcisms were something that were more common in Judaism and, and that day and in that part of the world. Uh, but as they watched him performing all of these miracles and then to hear the message, uh, they were in a quandary. <laughs> I mean, what do you do? Uh, they either had to claim that it was of God, and if they claimed it was of God, they would have to admit that this is a messenger of God, a son of God, the Messiah. They, they had to allude to that, even though they didn't want to. Or they had to come up with some other plan. They had to divide the plan. I think it was C.S. Lewis who once wrote that when you study the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ and the miracles of Christ and the works of Christ that you go away and, and you have to come to one of three conclusions concerning Christ. is either he was a, a lunatic, a liar, or he was the Lord. And that's the only option that you have left. And so here are these religious people that are dealing with these three things. Is Jesus a lunatic? Is he a liar? Or is he really the Lord? Now, we know, and we won't study this morning, but his family comes, his siblings come to him, and they thought that he was out of his mind. They thought he was a lunatic. Now, not Mary knew he was the son of God. She knew that from the beginning. And Joseph knew that he was the son of God, but his siblings, his half-brothers and half-sisters who were born after he was born, they thought he had lost his mind, and they, they were going to come and take him by force, and, uh, and so they had come to that conclusion. Others thought he was lying. He had to be lying. And so here are the religious crowd saying, well, if we say he's a lunatic or a liar, then the crowds are going to come against us. If we say he's of the Lord, then, then we're denying everything we've held to, and we're agreeing, and, and we're going to have to uh, bow down to him. And so they come up with a new plan. They claimed that the power by which he was doing all of these miraculous things was not through the power of God, but was through the power of Beelzebub, which was another term for Satan. That his powers were wicked in nature, and that the spirit that he claimed to be attesting to him being the Son of God through the miracles and the message that he was performing they stated was not a holy spirit, but was a unholy spirit, an evil spirit, a demonic spirit. And so they attacked the work of the Holy Spirit that was affirming that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God. And they were saying, no, th this is false. Th this is not true. Uh, he is doing these miraculous things through the power of the devil. He is nothing more than a puppet and an instrument of the devil. Now, folks, if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you've got to come to the same conclusion that Lewis mentioned. You're, you're going to have to leave here today and either admit that Jesus is Lord or you are believing that he is a liar or a lunatic because there's no other in between. Because of what he did and what he said, there leaves no other uh, explanation concerning Christ. So Jesus is, is confronting these religious leaders about their uh, accusations. And we see three things, basically, that he does as he confronts them. Now, first of all, he answers a controversy because they are saying by the ruler of the demons, he's casting out demons. Now, verse 22, when it mentioned that the scribes said, that phrase there is in a tense that means they were 
continuously saying it. I mean, we're not talking about something that was done in haste or one time. We're talking about a matter they were habitually saying. They were spreading these accusations continuously and constantly. They were tearing down or seeking to demean and put doubt in the minds of the people about what he was doing, why he was doing it. And so they're saying constantly he has Beelzebub, he has demons, he's controlled by the devil, he is under the domination of the ruler of the demons. So Jesus confronts the controversy in verse 23. It says, he then spoke to them in parables. Now this word parable is a word that means to cast alongside. Jesus was one that tried to give illustrations to help explain a truth. And a parable is somewhat like a, one person said a parable is first of all like a picture. And so he would paint a picture for them to try to understand the concept of what he's teaching. But the neat thing about a parable is that it can go from being a picture that it then turns into a mirror. So he paints a picture concerning who they were or their condition. And if they could comprehend and if they had a seeking heart, the picture would turn into a mirror. And then they would see themselves in the parable. And then if they saw themselves in the parable, it became a window. And a window that revealed the truth, allowed the truth to come in. So Jesus is always doing that. Now another reason he used parables is that a parable can either reveal truth or it can conceal truth. For those who were just kind of, you know, half-hearted and really weren't seeking truth, a parable would kind of conceal the truth. It would keep them blinded to the truth. But those who were seeking the truth, the parable would reveal the truth. And it was penetrating. It was personal. And so he gives this parable. He gives three different parables. Verse 24, he says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, then that kingdom would not stand. That's just common sense. He's saying, why would a kingdom fight itself? A kingdom, if it divides, it's weaker. It's not stronger. Then he said, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I mean, if there's conflict within the home, the home is not going to be healthy, <laughs> you know. Uh, if we want to take it in a very literal fashion, if a house has been hit by a tornado or some type of, uh, you know, natural disaster, if, it's, if the foundation is damaged and if it's structurally been, uh, you know, harmed, it's going to fall. It's not safe. And he says the house divided against itself is not going to mean it's stronger, it's weaker. And then he says that, and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided... He cannot stand. He said, why? He said, you're, you're, you're proposing an explanation that has no merit. And so what he's really revealing is that their theology, what they were believing, was faulty. He's saying, your belief system is, is messed up. Here, I'm, I've, I've come doing nothing but good. I, I've come and, and have healed. I, I've given sight to the blind. I've given uh, hearing to the deaf. I've allowed those who could never walk to walk and uh, those who could never talk to talk. And I've been able to deliver those who were uh, con controlled and, and uh, overwhelmed by demonic influences and many were demon-possessed. And he said, they've been set free and they're whole and they're in their right mind. He said, why would the devil do that to his own kingdom? Because that's not building it up, that would be tearing it down. And so he, he reveals to them that their theology is wrong. And folks, that's why we need to have good theology. Theology is just a word that means to study the Lord, study God, to have a right view of God. And we need to have a right theology. I want to tell you, if your belief system is wrong, your actions will be wrong. If there's division in your life, if there's division in your home, if there's division in your church, that's because there's a false belief system existing somewhere. Every time, if there's ever divisiveness among believers or divisiveness within a church or the divisiveness within a denomination, it's because there's faulty theology somewhere. And so he says to them, your theology, your belief system is completely wrong. 
And so they were trying to propose that because they refused to admit that he was the Son of God. They, they would not admit it. Now, I like the way in verse 27 he gives this particular uh, little punch. He says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Here's what he's telling them. He's saying, you're saying that I'm doing all this in the power of the devil. He said, the problem is, the devil is the strong man. He's the one that has controlled the house of some of these individuals that have been set free. He possessed them. You know, a demon does not have a body, so what does a demon do? It looks to oppress bodies, and sometimes a demon will possess bodies. And so he says to them, the devil is the strong man. Now, when I come, I'm the stronger man. And I bound the devil so that the one that he has possessed, he no longer has control. So he's saying, the devil is a strong man, I'm a stronger man, and the spoil, the plunder that is gained, the plundering of his goods, is the release of that soul that was under the domination of the demonic. He's saying, everything that you're building this on this faulty theology leads to the fact that it's not only faulty in its theology, it's faulty in its logic. The kingdoms the families, they do not increase by internal destruction. So he confronts through a parable that what they were saying had no merit theologically and it had no merit logically. So number one, we see the controversy answered. Number two, in the midst of this very difficult matter, he gives us some comfort. Thank goodness. Look at verse 28. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. Now that word blasphemy is a word that means to be irreverent or defiant toward God. Now folks, there's the promise. I mean, in the midst, right in the middle of a very controversy, controversial, challenging matter concerning the unpardonable sin, is a ray of hope, a reminder of hope. You know, there's a lot of people through my years of ministry have came to me, and they always want to ask questions about the unpardonable sin. I've had people that said to me, what if I've committed the unpardonable sin? And my answer is always, you have not. You have not. Because if you had, and if you have, you would have absolutely no concern. <laughs> you would have no concern about the fact if you had. Now, I can remember as a teenager, young theologue that I was, I was sure that in my witnessing encounters that I had met many that had met, committed the unpardonable sin. <laughs> and I remember going to my pastor one time and said, Pastor, I think one of my family members has committed the unpardonable sin because I was such a, you know, brilliant theologian, you know, at the ripe young age of 17. And... Uh, you know, I'd been reading the Bible for about six months and had a, you know, really had a grasp of it. And I remember him saying, he said, no, they have not. <laughs> they have not. Verse 28 is a reminder that if you're here today and you have not yielded your life to Christ, your sins can be forgiven. You may say, man, I've been defiant against God. I've said things that were very demeaning about God. I've cursed God. Well, he says all forms of blasphemy that they have uttered can be forgiven. All sins will be forgiven. I want to tell you, folks, that is something that we need to focus on more than the worrying about exactly what the unpardonable sin is or if somebody has committed. We need to focus on the fact that he is saying all sins will be forgiven. You know, one of the things, when I study the, the unpardonable sin... You know what it gives me hope? It gives me hope that every person that I preach the gospel to and every person that I share the gospel with has the ability to be saved. 
You know why I believe that? Because if they didn't have the ability to be saved, then why are we even worried about the unpardonable sin, period? What difference would it make what sin a person would commit if they don't have the ability to be saved? What difference would it make whether they're pardonable or unpardonable? And so when I come to this promise, folks, it reminds me that the grace of God has been extended to all. The long-suffering mercy of God has been extended to all. So here in the midst of this, this controversy of those who are questioning the Son of God, that He was divine and He was deity, here He reminds them that all manner of sins can be forgiven. I believe He was looking at some of these religious leaders and saying there is hope in the fact that I have come and sins can be forgiven and you need to come and receive forgiveness before it's too late. Verse 28, Surely, though King James says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Truly, amen, I say to you, I'm telling you the truth. The grace of God extends to all. There's none that are outside the bounds and the cloud of His forgiveness and His grace. All may come, whosoever will may believe. Here we have such great comfort. But let me just say this. Though the grace of God is extended to all, there is a day that the Holy Spirit may stop dealing with your heart if you're not saved. You know, you look at the Old Testament where the Bible says that God in His grace and mercy showed mercy toward the people. 120 years preaching the hope that they could be delivered from the judgment that would come. The Bible says that God will not continually, always, constantly strive with man. He gives you the choice. He gives you the opportunity to be saved. But there can be a day in the life of a lost person that some of the old evangelists called sending away your day of grace. Rejecting, resisting the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to the point that your conscience becomes so seared and hard and cold and indifferent that you don't even hear or sense the presence of the Lord's working to draw you to himself anymore. Christian, there's a sin in 1 John that speaks of the fact that once we're saved, if we become flippant in our relationship with God and we don't love him the way he's called us to love him and we drift and rebel and fall into sin, there is a sin unto death for the believer. That God cherishes the saving work of His Son so much that He will take His child out of this world rather than let that child of God stay in this world and literally just sin against the saving work of His Son, Jesus Christ. I hear people say that, you know, you'll die on God's timing. You'll die... And you won't die until it's the will of God. But I'll tell you, a child of God can die prematurely because of the fact that they have gotten out of fellowship with the Lord and rebelled against God. He will take that Christian out of this world. But here we have a third deadline sin. That leads us to our third point, the consequences that should be avoided. He who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Now, folks, that's pretty straightforward. Even an old Arkansas-educated boy like myself can understand what that means. It says that there is a sin that if you commit, there is no forgiveness. He who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. The unpardonable sin. Now, as we look at the consequences here that should be avoided, we recognize that to blaspheme, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit basically means a person is ascribing to the devil 
and his demons the work of the Holy Spirit that was being manifested in the ministry of Jesus. Now, what was the Holy Spirit doing? He was attesting to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. The miracles that Jesus performed and the word that he taught were attesting to the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit was affirming that. He was affirming it. He was confirming it. He was attesting to it. And they were coming along and saying, no, this is not the spirit of the Holy One. This is the work of the unholy spirit. And they were ascribing to the Holy Spirit that he, that he was the evil one. He was the wicked one. They were ascribing the work that only the Holy Spirit could do. And if you remember, Jesus tells us what he does. He says he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He convicts the world that the world is sinful, that we are sinners. He convicts us of the fact that Jesus is righteous, that he is the righteous one. And he convicts us to the truth that there will be judgment. That to reject the finished work of Christ and to reject who the Holy Spirit is saying Jesus is, is to face judgment. And so therefore... When they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, it was not a single act. It was not a one-time thing they did. It was a habitual action and attitude. It was a state of sin that they were living in. They kept on saying, this is the work of the devil. This is the work of the devil. And he said, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Condemnation, some translation writes damnation. It is a state of becoming so hardened, no longer sensitive to sin or the wooing power of the Holy Spirit leading us to the place where we reject our conscience, we reject grace, we reject the truth of the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is putting before us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, He is the exclusive way, He is the only way. And these people say, no, that is a demonic, devilish doctrine. And they had sinned a sin that there could be no forgiveness merited. There was no other means of forgiveness. Folks, when we reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God and we reject the person and work of Jesus Christ, when we resort, basically uh, don't accept the fact that Jesus is so exclusive that he's the only way, we are basically saying to the Holy Spirit, I don't agree with your work. I don't agree with what you're saying. I don't agree with what you're doing. This morning, if you're here and you've never been saved, my my word to you, and I would implore you to, to not wait another day. I don't know how many days God will continue to pursue and convict and woo you unto himself. Man, that, that would be a gamble that, that I don't think anyone should, should risk. To, to think of the, the consequence of eternal condemnation. That's why the Bible, every time it speaks of salvation, it's always in a present tense. That's why it always says, today is the day of salvation. Today. If you're here and you don't have peace and you're troubled about your standing with God, your relationship to Christ, I would say today is the day to settle it. Today is the day to resolve it. The grace of God is extended. Forgiveness is available. But the more we reject, the more we say no, it seems like the less we're sensitive to hear. Our conscience doesn't seem to stir us as much. We get calloused. And I have found that people that said no after so many times, it's so easy for them to say no just like that. They don't even give it a thought anymore. Oh, they used to at least contemplate, but now it's like, no, no, I'm not interested in that. Nope, no, I'm not. And I would say if you've never come to the Lord, today would be a day to come and agree with the Holy Spirit that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. 
who died to take away the sins of the world, and they include my sins, and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. Christian, I would encourage you to come to realize that it is, it is a, a fearful thing to realize that we've been given the gift of salvation and then to take it lightly to just be flippant about our salvation is also a very, very dangerous position to be in. And just come and say, Lord, forgive me that I, I have not cherished, I have not, I have not guarded, I, I have not recognized what a, a holy privilege I have to be a child of God and to be a possessor of eternal life. And forgive me for my unfaithfulness to Jesus. And that my love has waned for him. Come today and rededicate your life to Christ. We could sit around and talk about this for a long time, but I think Jesus' emphasis here is to remind us that he is the Son of God. He proved it by his works, he proved it by his words, he proved it by his resurrection. And this morning, I want to invite you to come and not to be so enamored with what is the unpardonable sin, but to be enamored with the fact of the fact that God the Father is able to forgive all sins if I will just place my trust in Him as my Lord and Savior. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, and our hymn of invitation this morning is an opportunity for you to come. And if you need to be saved, I want to invite you to come right now if you'd like to come and rededicate your life to Christ, this would be a wonderful morning to do that. You come as the Holy Spirit leads. Father, as we sing, may your Holy Spirit draw us unto yourself. May we leave here knowing we are in right relationship with you. If there is anyone here that has not received Christ, help them to see that there's still time. They can be saved today. But Lord, help them to realize there may come a day that that knock ceases. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.